Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Pentecostals of Lee Road. It is so good to see you. Why don't you reach around, shake someone's hand. Tell them I'm glad to see you on a Monday night. Welcome to family worship night. The word of the Lord says to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And we're going to do that tonight. We're going to start out with our worship. God bless you for being here. We're going to have a great night tonight. Why don't you stand to your feet and give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we enter into our worship segment tonight. God bless you.
says even the demons believe and tremble at the mention of that name. Hallelujah. I'm glad to know that I'm a person of the name. I'm part of the assembly of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm part of the body of Christ that's been baptized in his name. Hallelujah. 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 Woo. Feels good in the house of the Lord tonight. God bless you. Thank you for your response in worship. Thank you for helping create an atmosphere where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. And there is liberty and freedom in the house tonight. God bless you. You can make your way back to your seats. Maybe give someone a high five on your way back to your seat. <laughs> Just seems appropriate tonight. A few announcements for you. Wednesday night, this Wednesday night, war on the floor prayer meeting at 630. Please make note of that. We would love to see all of you back here at 630 Wednesday night for a corporate uh, time of prayer. We call it war on the floor. Also, this Friday night, there's a sectional youth rally here at the POLR at 730. Uh, Reverend Jathan Marcelli will be back preaching that youth rally. So please come out and support our young people. We will have a, 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 just a full house of young people, of teenagers. But we would like our adults and our parents to come uh, support your young people, please. Also, there's a, thank you. Also, there's a section one's women's rally at the Pentecostals of Mandeville at 7.30 where Reverend Robert Tisdale will be preaching to the ladies. But if you have a young person, if you have a teenager that will be coming to the youth rally, we ask that you please come as a parent uh, to support your young person here. This is the last youth rally of the year uh, and, and we want uh, as many of the parents of our young people here as possible, so please make note of that. Also, at this time, we have a very special report from a very special lady. Would you give Sister Donna Marcelli a hand as she comes? I'd like to um, let you know that we have a few of the little papers up here if you want to write your miracle reports. Yesterday we had eight people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Woo! Oh, thank you. What a great day. Thank you, Lord. And if there had been one that had received the Holy Ghost yesterday, it would have been worth everything. And it would have been worth Brother Tisdale coming and being with us. So I know that we have eight miracles to be written and put in here. We already have a couple. I want to remind you of that. As you pray for your miracles, we're going to put them in the nice little bucket here with the Florida de Lee on the front. Um, yesterday, now you, I, there are many people here tonight that I truly feel you need a supernatural intervention or a supernatural touch or a supernatural proof that God is real in your life and he knows you by name. And I'm telling you, if you will just open up a little bit, he is going to speak to you and he's going to make himself mighty in your life. Yesterday we had several particular instances that I feel was, is important to communicate to you. First of all, we are so thrilled to have Brother Russell Taylor, who's been with us and his family and his daughter, receive the Holy Ghost, a father and son yesterday. It was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. And then we had Amanda, who had her mother here, and her mother received the Holy Ghost yesterday. Awesome. And then we had uh, Sister uh, Sarah Durham, her sister, received the Holy Ghost yesterday. Woo! And it was one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen. Uh, Cheyenne, uh, uh, Katrina's daughter, was praying. And PJ, uh, uh, Paul and Sabrina's little boy, had a Kleenex and he was wiping her eyes as she was praying. It was the sweetest thing. And I just thank God for what he's doing and moving in such a miraculous and wonderful ways. And I saved the best for last. Um, there was, well, there was, uh, as you know, we have like a whole row now of Asian people. And some of them are from Thailand or Tha uh, Laos and different places. I can't keep up with the countries. But I want to thank uh, Pastor Nathan and Sister Haley. I'm sorry, Nathan and Haley and Pastor Greg and Sister Nikki for not being weary and well-doing. And uh, Paul has been coming for probably a year and a half. And we then his uh, 
now his wife has been coming also with him. And it just felt like, you know, God, come on, Lord, you know. It just felt like that they weren't moving very fast. And, and we prayed and did all we could. But I'm telling you, when God gets a hold of somebody, you know what? God just does miracles. That's all I can say. Uh, two Sundays ago, Paul came up to Pastor Greg and said, I have to be baptized today. And he was baptized. Yesterday, he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was so beautiful. And it wasn't but maybe five or ten minutes later that Sister Sherry Hudson brought a lady that has only come twice. Now, I want you to listen to this very closely. She cannot speak English, nor can she understand English. Sister Haley and Sister Nikki are teaching an English as a second uh, language class at 9.30 in the morning on Sunday. So they wanted to come in for the free concert. So they came for our free concert yesterday. It's her second time that she was here. Sister Sherry Hudson brought her up to me, and she, the lady was kind of trembling, and she said, I think she wants prayer. Well, Brother Tisdale was standing right here, and I said, Brother Tisdale, I don't know. I said, she's trembling. I think the lady may be ready for the Holy Ghost, but she cannot speak English, cannot understand English, and she does not have a clue of what you've said today or anybody else has said. I said, however, Paul, who had received the Holy Ghost about 10 minutes before, can interpret for you. So Brother Tisdale brings Brother Paul over and says, I want you to tell her this. He would tell Brother Paul what to say. He would speak it into her ear in her language, and you'd see her face change. Then Brother Tisdale says, and tell her this. She starts to pray. And then Brother Tisdale says, tell her that she is doing good and just to worship and not worry about what language she is speaking because she'll speak a heavenly language. And then Paul tells him that. And Paul kept trying to leave, and Brother Tisdale kept grabbing him. And it was the cutest thing. And the next thing you know... Her mouth was trembling, her hands were shaking, and she began to speak in an unknown language, and I knew it. I knew it. I could tell it. What a miracle. Then Brother Tisdale said, uh, ask her if she has spoken words that she did not understand, and she nodded her head and spoke to him, yes, I have said words that I do not understand, and he said, tell her that that is the spirit of the Almighty God, and it was just so beautiful. I had to tell you that tonight. There were others that received it, but God has done unprecedented things. What happens is, you know, if someone breaks a record, uh, say uh, for the yard dash, I don't know what y'all call it, but anyway, run it. And someone breaks a record. Then you find that when people see what's possible, there's just all kind of folks then that are able to do that. And I'm telling you, in the spirit yesterday, Sister Nikki Byers told me that she saw in a vision as we were worshiping. It was like a tornado force that began to swirl in here. She said, I saw angels and I saw soldiers that were lined up at the doors. She's... Sister Nikki, if you know her, she really doesn't do that very much. She said, I saw them at every door, and the Lord told her, there is no evil in here. I'm not allowing any evil to come, and anything today is possible. And yesterday, we broke through so many precedences that now, from now on, Brother Paul is going to be speaking the word, and many are going to receive the Holy Ghost. Y'all just give the Lord a hand clap of praise, a shout. He is here tonight. Let's stand, please. It's time for our offering tonight. Can you imagine the party that's going on in heaven? You know, the Bible says the angels rejoice when just one sinner repents. Hallelujah. If you're here tonight and you've never experienced that, you can tonight. Tonight could be your night. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, Let's go to the Lord and ask Him to bless this offering tonight. Father, we thank You so much for the liberty of the Spirit that we feel here today, tonight. God, You are so good. And Lord, we also rejoice, God, because I remember when I was first born again of the water and the Spirit, Lord, even as a child. And Lord, You didn't hold anything back, and You're not holding anything back from any hungry heart that's here tonight. And I thank You for every gift and giver. That's here tonight, and I pray you bless this offering, multiply it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. If you would march from the back to the front, God bless you. been honored, of course, to have Reverend Robert Tisdale with us the last couple of weekends. God only knows what's going to happen tonight and in the future as a result of his ministry. You know, revivals don't just happen. I don't believe it, it, it's just, you know, uh, just a random act. It takes a church body of believers with expectancy, with faith, willing to invest and willing to support what's going on here at the Pentecostals of Lee Road. And it also takes an evangelist it takes a man of God with a fresh word from God to preach the word under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And that's what we have been witnessing through the ministry of Brother Tisdale. We're honored to have you once again, Brother Tisdale. Please come. Would you stand and receive the man of God? Amen, amen, amen. So good to be in the house of the Lord. Tell your neighbor, say, God is fighting for you. God is fighting for us. Boy, I love that song. I just want to get on a pair of boxing gloves and go to the ring. They start singing that. I want to dance around a little bit, you know. Hallelujah. Who needs to speak Thai? The conviction and the power of the Holy Ghost surpasses language barriers. Amen. I was there eating Thai food this afternoon, following up. You know, the, the Bible says, he that wanted souls is wise. You have to be strategic in what you do each day. So I went in today and saw Paul and saw Psalms 45. I honestly don't know what his name is, but that's what he told me, Psalm. He said, Psalm 45, that's my name. So I said, hello, Psalm 45. So... And I quoted a little Psalms 45. He didn't know what I was doing when I did that. But uh, it was so good to be with that family and that extended family and friends. They were so excited that I was there with them. They couldn't talk enough about what happened yesterday and how the Holy Ghost touched their lives and trying to express it through their broken English and, and, and talk about. And, and Psalms told me that, you know, he wasn't supposed to be here. He's from Nashville, but he was here. And now he doesn't want to go back to Nashville. He wants to stay here. And, you know, it, I, I'm telling you, God knows what he's doing because there are people that are hungry for God and expression of God's spirit all around you. You work with them. You eat in their restaurants. They're the people that check you out in the grocery store. And you just have to get past the reservation and the hesitation that you feel as an individual. And just open up and talk about Jesus Christ. Amen? Such a great move of God. Eight Holy Ghost here yesterday. And now we've been doing a unique thing. I, I preached two weeks in Mandeville. And I think the number was ten Holy Ghost and four baptized or something like that. I'm not sure 
exactly. And then I was in La Ranja this last two weeks, and we had four last week get the Holy Ghost. Last week, how many do we have here get the Holy Ghost? Three something? I don't, I don't know what we had here Sunday morning. And then we had eight yesterday. So I'm not sure between the network of churches that is the Pentecostals of Lee Road, Covington, and Mandeville, what is that? Ten or, or eight, uh, four, three, ten, eight, I don't know, I don't know, 25, something like that. So we had 10 in Mandeville, eight here, that's 18, four in uh, La Ranja, that's 22, three last Sunday, 25, something like that. So I, I just, I think we ought to pause and give the Lord a little thanks for the last couple of weeks. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise and honor, adoration, accolades. We affirm you, God. There's none like you in our lives. For those of you that are guests here and don't quite understand what all the hubbub is about the Holy Ghost, the scripture tells us explicitly that when Jesus Christ was about to ascend into heaven after giving his life upon the cross, he said, I'm going, but I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Not someone else. I my spirit will come back. And when we talk about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, we use them synonymously. We're talking about God's presence taking up residence in the life of a human being. Every person in this room has the capacity to receive the presence of God. You can. That ability is yours. You will not quite understand it in its entirety. You're not designed to. For what man can truly understand God? When the Spirit comes in, there is a sign that was repeated throughout the New Testament that affirmed that God's presence came in. It was more than simply a public confession and an affirmation of faith. But there was a literal sign that accompanied in each portion of Scripture in the book of Acts when the Spirit fell. They spoke in a language they never knew. Now, that is a sign to you as words and phrases come out your mouth that you don't understand. That is a sign. Ah! He's in my life. It's a sign to me when I hear you, you've received the Spirit. But it's so much more than a visible, audible expression of God's Spirit. The Scripture said in Romans 8 and 22 that you do not know how to pray as you should. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for the needs of your life. Because when you pray in your natural language, in your English, you pray through the lens of your motives, your dreams, your desires, your prejudices, your anger, and your frustration. So all of your prayers are colored by your thoughts and your ideas. That's why the scripture, Romans 8, 22, said, you don't know how to pray as ye ought. Because the truth is, if you knew how to fix yourself, you would have fixed yourself long ago. So the Spirit comes in. And just as God created all things with the voice of creation, and all things that exist, He spoke into existence. When you begin to speak in the Spirit, you know the Spirit is interceding on my behalf. It's pleading my case. It's healing the brokenness in my life. And that's what I love about when I hear myself and the Spirit of God begins to speak through me. I know something's happening I don't see. I don't understand. I can't explain. And I rest in the knowledge and the faith that God is fixing what I don't even know how to pray about. No wonder you need to talk in tongues. The Bible said building up your most holy, precious faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. When you pray in the Holy Ghost and the Spirit speaks through you with that unknown language, the faith that you possess increases. It's no wonder some people struggle to believe for the supernatural. We only pray in our rationale. We only pray in our intelligence. But when the Spirit speaks through us, it expands our capacity to believe. Amen? So if you've never received the Spirit tonight, at any point in this service that you're ready, God's ready. All you have to do is raise your hands. There is only one prerequisite. It's a sincere and repentant heart. Asking God to forgive your sins. And when you ask, He does. And the scripture declared, If your evil father knows how to give give good gifts, how much more does your heavenly father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask? All you have to do is ask. That's it. So glad you're here. Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them. Say, the transcendent power in what we see. 
That's what I want to minister to you tonight about. The transcendent power of what we see. You may be seated. Now, you know, I should preface this. Pastor Jenkins made fun of me. (laughs) Pastor Byers teased me. Pastor Trinicost teased me that I've preached on three blind men in three services. (laughs) Trying to bail himself out now, isn't he? I'm going to preach about vision tonight, if that's all right. You know, perhaps the most often quoted biblical passage regarding vision is Proverbs 29 and 18. Where there is no vision, people perish. Or more specifically, they fall apart. They go back to pieces. And the inverse is true. Where there is vision, people prosper. Where there is vision, people are blessed. There is evidence, manifold, ample evidence of this reality in the sacred record of the Word of God and in the secular history books that what we see impacts who we are and what we accomplish. Whether that be for good or whether it be for evil, righteousness or wrong. For you cannot deny that the ruination of our race was prefaced by this phrase. For the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. To be desired to make one wise. And the rest of that sordid story is history. When Elisha's servant... Looked out across the plain of Dothan. He saw the Syrian army had surrounded he and his master. And he knew their capture or death was imminent. He understood that death was nearby. He ignored the many miraculous works that had been wrought by the prayers of his master and the prophet. And he ran into the house resignation in hand, fear in his mouth, and he would have fled on foot had Elisha not grabbed him and saved him from himself and his narrow vision. Because moments later, after the prophet prayed, the same servant looked across the plain of Dothan and saw horses and chariots, the host of heaven. They filled those same mountains. And with his heart swelling with newfound courage, he said, how foolish are those Syrian soldiers forever raising their hand against God's anointed servant. There are more with us than there be against us. He saw it. He declared what he saw. And what he said ultimately was a function of what he did. Who and what you believe is entirely a function of what you see. Nothing more, nothing less. Ask Simon Peter if it makes any difference what you see. Matthew 14 and 24. The scripture said, And the winds and the waves were contrary in the middle of the sea, in the midst of a storm. In fact, I just love this passage because Matthew 8 and 24, the scripture tells us that they were in a storm and the winds and the waves were boisterous. And what I love about the symmetry of these two particular passages is one storm, Jesus is asleep in the boat. Six chapters later, same verse designation, another storm engulfs the boat. But this time, Jesus has ratcheted up the level of difficulty. He's not in the boat asleep this time. He has left them alone in the boat, constrained them, the scripture said, to cross the sea. And he's praying on the mountain. And about the middle of 
of the night, he comes striding across the waves as the waves are engulfing their boat. As fear and frustration are filling the hearts of men, they're frightened, they're screaming, they're overwhelmed. And here comes Jesus. And the scripture said that these handpicked men cried out and said, it's a ghost. That gives a lot of confidence, doesn't it, in the disciples? In the midst of a storm and immediately they're intimidated by what they see. They're overwhelmed by the adversity. They they revert very quickly back to old superstitious ideas and frustrations. And they say it's a ghost. And Jesus says, be not afraid. It's I. Let me tell you something I want you to hear right now. If you're in a storm and the voice you're hearing is not one of peace, you're not listening to Jesus. There are only two recorded storms that Jesus is in in his earthly ministry. One is Matthew 8. One is Matthew 14. Those two particular storms. In one, he is resting in the bottom of the boat. And as it, as Simon Peter shakes him awake and says, Do you care not that we perish? He steps up and says, Oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Steps to the bow of the boat and says, Peace be still. And then in Matthew 14, he's walking through the waves. The disciples are fearing for their lives. And Jesus says, Be not afraid. It is I. Let me tell you something very specifically. There are only two things God speaks in storms. Peace and come. That's it. And so if you're hearing something else. If life is filling you with fear and apprehension. The voice of Christ speaks order in chaos. It speaks stability and instability. And God will either speak peace to your storm. Or call you out to walk in faith. There's only two. Two methods of Christ communication when all hell's breaking loose. He's either saying, hey, be at rest, be of good comfort, or come up a little higher. I got something else I'm going to release in your life. So if you're hearing fear, if you're hearing intimidation, if you're hearing negativity, it is not the voice of Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to feel some a little bit of spirit right there. Because some of you in the middle of some disillusioned circumstances. And you've been wondering what's going on. And you're hearing uh, chaos of voices and confusion. But if it's not peace or it's not faith, it's not of God. You ought to tell somebody right now. If it's not peace you're hearing. If it's not uh, promotion you're hearing. It's not of God. Whew, that makes me feel good. You know why? Because it's very easy then to put that standard up against uh, the voices of fear and intimidation, uh, accusation, uh, those uh, those judgments, uh, those false accusations that roll against me. And when I hear them, you're about to fail. Maybe you don't understand. When I hear those voices say, you're not coming out of this. I know it's not God. When they say, you're not going to make it through this. This is all your fault. And it's condemnation and it's guilt and it's frustration. It's real easy. Look at the scriptural principles laid down in Matthew 8 and Matthew 14. That's not the voice of my Savior. My Savior says, peace be still. My Savior says, be of good comfort. It is I. My Savior says, step out and step on a little higher. I got something better for you. You ought to raise your hands and receive the peace of God right now. Peace in the name of Jesus. Peace by the power of the righteous, sovereign name of Jesus Christ. Raise your hands again. In Jesus' name, every chaotic manifestation of intimidation and frustration that the enemy is throwing up in your face, I speak peace to every soul. Peace to every young person. Peace to every marriage. Peace to every troubled spirit. In the name of Jesus. But what you see affects how you perform, what you become, what occurs in your life. Jesus says, be not afraid, it's I come. Come. Simon Peter says, if it's really you, bid me to come to thee. And Jesus says, come. And based upon the authority and the sovereignty of the word of Jesus Christ, Simon Peter does what no human being had ever done. He steps out over the gunwale of that boat, puts his foot upon the water, and he walks upon the word of God. 
And I'll make sure you understand the designation and the difference of what I said. He doesn't walk on water. He walks on word. You cannot walk on water. But you can walk on the word. You cannot walk on water. But you can walk on the word. Because the word of God will make the impossible possible. The word of God will cause the invisible to become visible. The word of God can take the unlikely, the improbable. And it will make it entirely reality. It will bring it into substance. It will bring it into fruition. And what you have to know is you don't have to be able to overcome the circumstance you're in. You only need a word from God. Because a word from God will defy nature. A word from God will defy the issues and the logic that you're front confronting and the rationale that is your trouble. So Jesus speaks and says, walk. Come. That's it. Come. Just one word. And one word defies the laws of nature. And he steps out and begins to walk on the word. And then the scripture says... That when he saw the winds and the waves, that they were boisterous, he began to sink. Because what you see affects what happens in your life. Get your eyes off the waves. Get your eyes off the frustrations. Get your eyes off the rain and the lightning and the thunder. Get your eyes off what you perceive to be impossible and put your trust in the Word of God. Uh, Someone in this house needs to understand uh, that what God has planned for you defies logic. It defies reason. It defies the conditions of the reality you're in right now. So stop looking uh, at what you can see and get your eyes on what you cannot see. Get your eyes right now uh, off of of the natural disaster that is encompassing your life and put your eyes on Jesus Christ. Oh, I wish someone would hear a simple word from the Lord tonight. Take your eyes off the divorce, the frustration, the abuse, the hatred, the anger, the rejection, and turn your eyes toward Jesus Christ. For anything is possible when you look at the right thing. I'm telling someone in this room tonight, you can come out of what you're in. You can be free. Your life can have peace. You can defy the logic of natural laws and man if you get your eyes on the right thing. Hands are raised and hearts are open right now. He began to sink when he saw the waves and the wind. I'll prove to you he's not walking on the water. Jesus said, uh, and what I love about this is when you're walking with God in faith, the scripture says that as he began to sink, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Now, I find that that whole story and the lack of detail a little bit frustrating, I'll be honest with you. Evidently, Jesus isn't right beside the boat. Because they can't recognize Jesus, so they assume he's a ghost. So let's just, let's for a moment, let's analyze and let's exegete this scripture a little bit. Uh, Evidently, Jesus is far enough away, they can't see him properly, right? And then not only is he far enough away, the winds and the waves are boisterous. Because the scripture says that. That Simon Peter, when he looks at the waves, uh, that, that he begins to sink. So evidently, when Jesus speaks a word, it doesn't calm the storm. But that's our problem sometimes. The last time Jesus spoke in a storm with Simon Peter, the waves stop. Oftentimes, our expectation level undermines our own faith and ability to trust the Word of God. Because we think when God speaks, storms stop. But sometimes the greater miracle is not the storm abating. It's being kept through the difficulty. Oftentimes, it's a greater miracle for you to walk through the cancer and come out unscathed than it is for God to remove it the first time you pray. Oftentimes, God will show the glory of his power on your life after you go to the grave Lazarus he could have sent a word to Bethany and healed Lazarus before he died but he let him go to the grave that he might be glorified after four days defeating death But our expectation level will undermine our belief system because we think, well, Jesus Christ has been marketed in such a way that if you spin around seven times on one foot, say in Jesus' name and babble in tongues a little bit, you'll never get sick and there'll never be a problem and nothing will ever go bad. And Jesus is marketed as snake oil and an elixir and a cure-all. But sometimes he speaks a word in the storm and expects us to trust him enough to tread on the water and 
walk through the waves and ignore the lightning and the roaring of the thunder. Sometimes the storm doesn't stop, but that does not invalidate the divine authority and providence of his word. I want someone in the middle of your chaos. Get your eyes off the storm and put them on Christ. You know why I want you to? Because God is fighting for us. That was your cue. If I was in black church in Oakland, you'd be up there playing right now, dude. He put me in a robe. You think I preach good now? You ought to see me in a black robe. This white man can jump, brother. (laughs) Don't act like you were a Christian all your life. (laughs) But if you can take your eyes off the situation you're in and put them on Jesus Christ... Anything is possible. Because what you see affects what you become. That's why what Paul said has such power for our lives. He said, for we look not at the things which are seen, but we look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You cannot allow the frustrations of your condition to limit your response to what God is doing in your life. Mark 5, she had spent all she had. She had suffered 12 young years. She was nothing better but rather grew worse. She had suffered indignities at the hands of medical science. They had tried everything. Evidently she's a wealthy man, wealthy woman because the Bible is specific to tell us that she has exhausted her limits, her finances. She has exhausted them in a pursuit of some type of healing. You say, why would she do that? I'll tell you why. She's hemorrhaging from her female parts. And according to Mosaic law, she can have no relationships as long as she's hemorrhaging. In fact, the chair she sits on, unclean. You can't sit in it. The table she sits at, unclean. You can't have dinner with her. The bed she lays down upon, unclean. The sheets, unclean. If you touch her sheets, if you sit at her table, if you hold her hand... You're defiled and you cannot move into the worship experience with your God. And so she is alienated on the outside of relationship. She has no worship experience. She cannot go to the temple. She cannot purchase a goat or a dove to atone for her sins. She's ostracized and alienated. So whatever the cost has been, it's not been very much to her. She wants to hold her kids again. She wants to look her husband in the face and kiss him on the lips and hold his hand but she's defiled for 12 years she can't live with her mama she can't live with her daddy she can't have a relationship and the scripture said and when she heard it was Jesus she came in the press behind and she touched his clothes and immediately Jesus turned and said who touched me and his disciples said what do you mean who touched you look at the throng master around you. Look at the crowd around you. And he said, oh no. Virtue left my body. You understand by touching his clothes, she defiled Jesus Christ. But your sin does not defile him. Virtue flows out of him and heals you. Get your eyes off the money you spent. Get your eyes off the failed counseling sessions. Get your eyes off the pain in your body. Get your eyes off the failed relationships. Get your eyes off the despair, depression, and frustration. Push through it. Hands are raised and hearts are open right now. What you see affects where you go. It affects what you become. It makes a difference. Evidently, the devil understands the transcendent power of what we see. Evidently, Satan himself understands the power that is resident in what you look upon. For he took Jesus into the wilderness. And he says, look, do you see all the kingdoms of the world? 
they're mine to give you. All the kingdoms of the world, the scripture said, in a moment of time. If you only bow down and worship me, they're yours. Evidently, Satan thought what Christ saw would work. Or he would have never attempted to sway his discipline with what he showed him. You understand what he showed him? For Jesus was offered the opportunity to purchase what the cross would buy without suffering. I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth for their mind to give. If thou will just worship me. Bend your knees and it's all yours. No humiliation, no pain, no rejection, no suffering, no mockery, no laughing. It's a shortcut to the kingdoms of the world. It's yours if you will only worship me. You see, but Jesus understood a simple reality. What you worship, you serve. That's why if you worship money, you'll serve your career. And church will be a secondary responsibility in your life. That's why if you worship a high, you'll serve addiction. And it doesn't matter if it's snorting glue, sniffing paint, or sticking an air compressor up your nose. You'll do whatever you got to do to get a high. You didn't know I knew about that, did you? If you worship, you hear me right now. If you worship popularity, you'll give up your virginity. You'll let go of your morals. You'll do whatever you got to do to worship being popular. Because what you worship, you serve. And Jesus understood, if I bend my knee and worship Satan, I'll serve him. I want somebody to hear me right now. What you see determines where you go. That's why when the Israelites have gotten so frustrated with their light bread, they said, Moses, have you brought us out here to die? Were there not enough graves in Egypt? And the scripture said that they were fussing and fighting. And they, in fact, the scripture says it exactly this way in Numbers 21. And they spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. And then they said three particular things. Our soul loatheth this light bread. Have you brought us out here to die? Were there not graves enough in Egypt? And what I find unique is I don't really read them in that passage speaking against God. I only read them speaking against Moses. But it is one and the same. That's why you better be careful when you speak against your man of God in your life. That's why you better be careful when you speak against the pastor God has placed in your life to bring spiritual direction and healing, correction and instruction. Oh, that's why you got to be careful because God takes that very serious. They really only spoke against Moses, but the scripture says they spoke against God. Because speaking against God's man is the same as speaking against God. And the scripture said that serpents were released amongst the people. And that those fiery serpents begin to move throughout the people. And it begin to bite them. One after the other. It begin to bite them. And they begin to fall sick from the venom. And many begin to die and perish. They begin to get sick. But you know what a man of God does? Even when he was spoke against, the scripture says, And Moses prayed for the people. You better thank God every day. That no matter how you've ever treated the man of God, he's still praying for you. And the scripture declared that as he prayed, the Lord said, well, just make me an make me a image of that which has infected and bitten the people. Make an image of that which has poisoned them. Make a brass serpent and put it on the pole. Put it on a pole and lift it up above the people. And whoever looks at that brass serpent will be instantly healed. And... Moses fashioned a brass serpent, an image, an emblem of what had infected and poisoned their lives. He placed it upon a pole, and in the center of camp, they elevated it above the heads of the people. And the scripture said, no matter how advanced, no matter how ill, no matter how sick, no matter how frustrated, no matter how difficult their condition was, as soon as they looked, they were miraculously healed. We're quick to quote John 3, 
We're quick to say that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. But would you roll back to verse 14? For it says, even as Moses lifted up a brass serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Do you understand what's happening in Numbers 21? Is only a mirror image of what's happening in our current day. If you can get your eyes off the poison, the venom, the rotten flesh, the frustrations, the pain, the confusion, and you can look and get your eyes on Jesus Christ. Peace, healing, deliverance can be yours. What you see makes a difference. Stand to your feet right now. It really is about what you look at. It really is about looking beyond the frustrations and the issues that are your reality in your life. What you see determines where you'll be. It's the transcendent power of what we gaze upon and what we look at. So many different people here tonight from so many different walks of life. Some in pain in your body. Some fighting despair, depression, confusion. Others frustrated over finances and work opportunities, relationships. Some rolling along pretty good, but your eyes are just gazing at issues, frustrations. But right now, If you can take your eyes off the pain and the frustration, the fear, the failure, and you can begin to look toward Christ, the impossible becomes possible. The poison's eradicated. The sin is removed. The frustrations abate. But it all depends on what you see. Storms, Sickness, serpents, frustrations, or the Savior. So if you're here and chaos reigns in your family tonight, turn your eyes toward Christ. If you're sick in your body, look beyond the pain and give Christ an opportunity to heal your body. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, Look beyond the fear, the hesitation, the skepticism. And let the presence of God be magnified in your life. Just look beyond where you are right now. Would you raise your hands all over this house and lift your eyes toward him? Literally and figuratively. Just begin to lift that head and open that spirit. Raise those hands. I've preached about three different blind men. And tonight I've really just summed it all up in one issue. It is perhaps one of my most favorite texts. Hebrews chapter 11. The scripture begins to speak of Moses. Begins to talk of him and what he endures and the afflictions he confronts. You ready? Put it on the board for me. I want you to see it as we conclude this evening. Watch. For the scripture says that by faith he forsook Egypt. By faith he didn't fear the wrath of the king. By faith, look, look, just start at 23, that's perfect. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw, because they saw something in him. They defied the law and the proclamation of Pharaoh that all children under two must die. And they weren't afraid of the king's commandment because they saw something in their child. You ready? Verse 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Only God can have a mother see the potential in her child 
and place him in a reed boat and float him down a crocodile infested Nile River and him to float into the private lagoon of the princess of Egypt. And her say, I want this little Hebrew boy. I know we're slaughtering them all, but I want him, daddy. I want him. And then Pharaoh would say, well, you can't raise him. He's not an Egyptian. Hire a nanny. And the nanny that they hire is Moses' mama? Don't tell me that God can't orchestrate the details of your life for your best benefit. You say, but you don't know how bad it is. I know how big God is. You ready? And then mama tells him, son, you're not an Egyptian. This isn't who you are. This isn't your identity. You're not uh, who you're studying with and who you're running with and who you're hanging with. That's not who you are. You're not an Egyptian. Uh, You're an Israelite. You're God's chosen. That's not who you are. And then you're ready. Verse 25. Watch this. Choosing rather. Moses chose rather to suffer affliction uh, with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He forsook Egypt. Said no it's not worth it. Uh, I'll suffer with the slaves. Now watch. And this is how he did it. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches and the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense. He said, I'm not living for the temporary. For we look not at the things which are seen. But I'm looking at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, they're only temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. I'm living for another day. It's not about right now. It's about what God has for me. What's coming? Now watch verse 27. And here's the key. You ready? Uh, Oh, by faith. Say it, by faith. By faith. He forsook Egypt. What? Not fearing the wrath of the king. And under his cloak, he carried four million ex-slaves through a Red Sea. Not fearing the wrath of the king. And this is how he did it. For he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Moses made it because he refused to let his eye get on what was visible and temporary. And frustrating. But he endured. Because he looked beyond the difficulties of the challenge in front of him. And he saw him who was invisible. The God that consumed that burning bush. But didn't burn it. That God. That I am. That I am. He saw him who was invisible. And I want someone in this house to hear me right now. You can come out of what you're in. But you don't come out fearing the wrath of the king. Enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. You come out seeing him who is invisible. Get your eyes off your frustrations. Get your eyes off your pain, your sickness, your weariness, your your irritations. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Every hand is raised and every heart's open right now. If you're here and you're willing to change your focus, if you're here and you're willing to look beyond the issues that confront you and begin to place your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, I want you to come right now. Hurry. If you're willing to tell Him, Lord, I'm not looking at the natural thing. I'm willing to see you who is invisible. There you go. Come all over this house. Bring someone. Grab their hand and say, come on. Let's go realign our focus. Let's go see beyond our current conditions. Let's go see beyond the frustrations in our lives right now. There you go. Keep coming. Just keep coming. Oh, yeah. Everyone take a step closer for me. There's lots coming tonight. There you go. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Invite someone to come to the altar with you right now. Lean over and say, would you like to come? Come on.
all over this house. Just open yourself to the presence of the Lord right now. Your eyes are closed. Your hearts are open. For he endured by seeing he who was invisible. There's not a disease that cannot be healed. There's not a sin that cannot be forgiven. There's not a life that cannot be changed. There's not a touch that defiles the presence of God. Take your eyes. Shift your eyes. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. There you go. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Are you ready? All over this house, I'm going to lead you through prayer. I'm simply going to walk you through a very simple prayer of surrender and submission. And as we pray and we ask, God's going to immediately forgive us. Our mistakes, our failures, our sins. He's going to forgive because we ask. For the scripture said that He is faithful and just to forgive us all of our sins. Are you ready? It's going to happen all over this house as we ask. And as we're forgiven, we're going to turn our eyes from our failures and frustrations. And we're going to look upon our Savior. And the Spirit of God is going to fall across this house. The Spirit of God is going to heal, deliver, save. People are going to receive the Spirit for the first time. Some of you have never spoken other tongues. It's never happened. But it's going to sweep over this house tonight. Do I have anyone that believes that's going to happen right now? Some are in the altar. Some are in the pews. But it's going to happen all over this house. Are you ready? Put your hands just like this with me. It's simply a sign of surrender. It's nothing magical. It's just I'm, I'm giving up. I'm surrendering. You ready? Here's what I want you to do. Close those eyes. No looking around. And just say, Jesus... I surrender. I submit to your purpose and to your plan in my life. I will admit I've been looking at things I should not look at. I have had my eyes upon frustration, failure, disappointment, and difficulty. Forgive me for not believing that you can fix who I am where I've been and what I've done so I ask you now forgive my sins forgive my mistakes forgive my failures forgive my attitude forgive my lifestyle forgive my nature forgive my desires forgive me the things I do that displease you and that separate me from your presence. Forgive me. For if you don't forgive me, I cannot be saved. So Lord, I ask for your grace. I ask for your mercy. I ask for forgiveness. Save me from my sins and save me from myself and as you forgive me I release forgiveness to others I don't deserve to be forgiven but I raise my hands and in complete trust and faith in your word I receive forgiveness for who I am where I've been and what I've done I raise my hands and I receive forgiveness for all of my sins. Now go ahead, let him cover you with grace right now. Go ahead, lift that head and let his forgiveness roll over your life, your future, your past, and your present. Raise those hands and begin to tell him, thank you, Jesus. I don't deserve this, but I thank you. I'm not worthy of this, but I thank you. I'm not good enough, but I thank you. I raise my hands. I turn my eyes 
arise from these issues that have frustrated my faith. And I look upon you. I look upon you, God. You're doing exactly right, sir. You see, it can't be that simple. Oh, but it is. That's why he gave his life on a cross. And he said, if I be lifted up, if you look on me, I'll forgive you. I'll make it right. Come on, let the venom be healed. Let the poison be healed right now. Your hands are raised. Tell him, I receive my forgiveness. I receive my forgiveness. Now you're ready. The Spirit of God's going to fall on your life right now. Raise those hands. The Scripture said if you ask, He'll fill you with the gift of the Spirit. A language you never learned is going to come out your mouth. You're going to speak as the Spirit gives the utterance. You'll hear it, but you're going to let it go. You're going to let it talk. You ready? Raise those hands all over this house. By the authority of the Word of God. By the sovereignty of the name of Jesus. Receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. Raise your hands and let it flow out your mouth. Let it roll out of your spirit. Let it talk through your soul. You don't know how to pray about yourself. But the spirit knows. The spirit knows. The spirit knows. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's it. That's it. That's it. Pray. Pray. Pray all over this house. The ministry's moving through this assembly, putting their hand upon you, praying with you, partnering their faith with you. The Spirit's falling in this room right now. Just open up your mouth and let it fall. You're doing exactly right. You're...
receiving the Holy Ghost tonight. Uh, it's fallen in the house of God. Uh, three already talking in tongues tonight. If you've never received the Spirit, you don't have to leave without it. Hallelujah. Your hands are raised all over this house. You're putting your eyes on the Lord. Not on the wind and the waves. Not on the sickness and the pain. Not on the fear and the frustration. But you're putting your eyes on the Lord. You need to tell Him across this house. You need to raise your hands and your heart. Your eyes. Looking beyond the frustration you're in right now. Come on, that's it. Let worship consume us right now. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
the talking in tongues right now. Somebody give God a little thanks. Somebody give God a little praise. Thank you.